Hey there folks, welcome back to the Property Couch Podcast and have we got a great episode for you today. We're going to cover the Diderot Effect. Don't know what that is? Well, we're definitely going to cover that today and we're also going to talk about five wealth destroying myths that you need to know. Ben, what else are we going to talk about? We're going to double click, Bryce, on great expectations and the positives and the negatives attached to that and in what's making property news, is Melbourne now a bigger population than Sydney? We will find out later in the show. Mate, you should stick around for that, folks. It is a cracking show. Let's rip into it now. Welcome to The Property Couch, where each week you get to listen to two of Australia's leading experts. Bryce Holdaway, co-host of Location, Location, Location Australia on Foxtel's Lifestyle Channel, co-host of Escape from the City on the ABC and partner of Empower Wealth Advisory. Ben Kingsley, Chair of Property Investors Council of Australia and the founder of Empower Wealth Advisory, named the 2018 and 2019 Property Advisory Firm of the Year. Stay tuned as they bring you the Insider's Guide to Property, Finance and Money Management. All right, folks, welcome back to the Property Couch Podcast and welcome back to you too, mate. How are you? Disciplinary. Disciplinary. <laughs> I think I've got it. I think I'm You've back. Been practicing all week. Yeah. <laughs> for those for those who didn't listen last week, Ben. Oh yeah. That, if, if you missed the episode last week, you understand what happened. <laughs> hey, I want to talk footy. Can we talk footy? No. Oh, let's, let's talk footy. No. No. We can't. I well, think you should come across, mate. I think you should become a pie. Yeah. I right. We, 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 we welcome all sorts. Is this the bit where me and the the community have to endure you giving us uh, quarter by quarter feedback on how well your team did um, yesterday? Are you just going to stay sort of humble at the top level and go, it was a good game to watch and you're lucky enough to win? Yep, we, we were lucky enough to win. Find a way. The boys did it again. Um, yeah. Also to obviously our Anzacs, um, unbelievable. Yeah. We love everything you did, the ultimate sacrifice for some. But a uh, huge day always is, you know, personally my favourite a public holiday on the calendar. Mm. Um, so, yes, yeah, so to all of those people who have obviously, uh, you know, uh, committed themselves to the service uh, for freedom and also those who are currently in active service, we say a, a huge thank you uh, to all the work you do. Here, here, Ben. Very well said. Um, uh, I went to the uh, to the Sydney game, uh, the yep. Geelong-Sydney game, Ben, and um, the, I think the AFL um, uh, really does a good job with Anzac services anyway. Um Cheeky mate of mine, right? I um, if you're down at uh, GMHBA, there's a um, obviously my son is a Geelong supporter, enjoying going down. They've got the Premiership stand, Ben. There's a window, and they have all their cups up. And as you walk past, you can see it. And I did notice that uh, the, the the Premiership cups weren't in the window, and uh-huh. I'm thinking, oh, that's interesting, right? Later on, it became clear on why that is because they had them all lined up on the oval to reveal the flag. Um, and then a mate of mine who's there, he's sitting oh, in the safety of being about 500 metres away from me. He goes, mate, did you did you walk past and see that the cups weren't actually in the window? And I've gone, yeah, yeah, I did notice that actually. And then he goes, feel familiar? <laughs> oh, <laughs> like, oh, mate. Not only am I already hurting this season with Fremantle's form, he's then gone and dropped the dagger on me. So, um, so yes, uh, Jared, it does feel familiar that uh, we've no premiership silverware <laughs> sure. in the window. <laughs> yeah, so I'd never do that to you, never. No, no, no. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. Hey, um, uh, you got a survey, Ben. You want to find out a, a thing or two about our community? Yeah, I'd love to um, to get some insights. Basically, we've got a, we've set up a little one-minute survey. It's effectively two questions. And what we're trying to learn is how did you first discover the podcast? That's all we want to know. So in the show descriptions, there's a simple link um, and it just asks a simple question. So if you could uh, reach, you know, we're reaching out to you uh, as a favour to sort of say, you know, tell us the very first way in which you discovered us. Was it word of mouth? Um, Was it through through one of the books that we've written in terms of, you know, was it through social media? We'd love to just know um, how you found out about us because that helps us obviously find ways in which we can get our message out there because we're passionate about building the community, um, you know, and basically on that journey of financial freedom. So ultimately, from our point of view, that will be a great help. So yeah, if you could uh, spend one minute on that survey, that would be awesome. So to make it easy for folks, it's in the show description. Whilst you're listening, Ben, there'll be a link. You can click on and answer those two questions. Um, We, uh, You and I are really proud of the fact that um, when we go and read all the reviews, people say some really nice things. But if if I was to summarize a fair bit of the feedback that we get, it's 
I wish I'd found out about you sooner. Um, yeah, is great point. What we, and and I, you know, with humility from you and I, I think it's because we because we really um, set the foundations of what people need to know around property, and obviously to do it our way to do two thousand dollars a week. It's not for everyone, but it's yeah. it's a proven formula that we've um, done for over twenty plus years. Um, so <clears throat> you and I would love to think that everyone uh, listens to the podcast, Ben, but it, we are actually still a secret. Not mm. many people know about the property couch. And so um, by filling in that survey, it allows us to have a better understanding of how you found out about us. Whenever we're at a show or we get to meet someone, they walk up and they say they listen to the podcast. It's definitely the first question I ask, tell me how you heard about it. I love finding out those backstories. So that's the mission that we're on. So I know, Ben, when, you know, people's, days are busy and you lots of surveys and come on surely boys you don't want us to fill in another one you've deliberately made it two questions <laughs> two questions and we don't need to know who you are literally it's yeah. anonymous so yeah. just pop, bang bang that's all you need to do we get the data that helps us to coordinate our efforts to reach out to your point bryce we see it often in terms of i wish i'd found you earlier i would have avoided the mistakes episode one is about you know make those mistakes and people being done with money so that's ultimately what you know. What our mission is is to try and uh, minimise the number of mistakes that people make uh, on their wealth creation journey. Yeah, brilliant. So, um, so if you could help us out, folks, we would appreciate that. We would consider it a favour. Please click on the show description, uh, click on that um, survey, and and let us know a bit of the backstory about how you came across the property couch. And also, Ben, on that note, if you yeah. feel like you know someone who would benefit from listening to those first foundational twenty episodes. Um, that is how we've organically grown this podcast over the eight years that we've been doing it. It's a friend telling a friend telling a friend. Um, so we'd certainly love to encourage that behavior um, to continue. So, um, And uh, <clears throat> we are growing here on the podcast, Ben. We've got a wonderful team of Stigs in the background, um, but I just want to do a shout out. If anyone wants to be a part of the Property Couch, we're looking to fulfill uh, another role to add with our team uh, as a set of sticks. It's a um, it's a coordinating role. There's lots of content that you get involved with. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to put a, a link in the show notes to have a look at that job description uh, to see if anyone wants to be a part of that. Um, it's a full-time role uh, helping us um, with our content um, across the platform. We're excited about that. And um, if you feel like you want to be a part of the mission to help us teach people about property investing. You have a backstory in marketing. Uh, you have a backstory in content and putting um, ideas together like what we do on the podcast. Please reach out to us. We would love to have a coucher come and join us on the podcast. So check that out. Hey, um, we got a big show today, Ben. Um, it is uh, a, a continuation of our Mythbuster series, which is basically we want to talk to our team and said, what stuff keeps coming up for you? Um, in each of your disciplines that you think other people um, should know as a myth that needs to be busted on their way to becoming $2,000 a week. So we've got a, uh, from the planning team, we've got five really great myths that we're going to bust today. And I'm super excited about, about that. Um, but before we get there, Ben, my mindset minute theme, I need you to just um, strap in, Ben, because... Um, oh, this is a ripper. I'm strapping in. This is a ripper. The, there's a bit in this, folks, but I think it's a really good story um, to help you understand what is called the Diderot effect. Um, James Clear uh, brought this up. It's no surprise, Ben, that we're James Clear fans on this podcast for a couple of reasons. A, his content's great. B, he's been a guest of uh, of ours on the podcast. And C, just comes up with lots of thought leadership. But um, the Diderot effect can help people make more mindful and intentional choices about their consumption. So what is... The Diderot effect. Well, it refers to the phenomenon of acquiring new possessions that lead us to uh, lead to a spiral of consumption, making us feel dissatisfied with what we already have. The effect is named after the French philosopher Denis Diderot, who wrote an essay in 1769 entitled "Regrets for My Old Dressing Gown." That's important for my old dressing gown. You'll make sense. It'll make sense in a second. So, in this essay, Diderot describes how he received a new dressing gown as a gift and how it made him dissatisfied with his other possessions. He then felt the need to replace his old possessions with new ones that match the elegance of his new gown, leading to an ever-increasing spiral of consumption. So the Diderot effect is often described, um, how, used to describe how small purchases or changes can snowball into larger ones, leading 
to a cycle of consumption that can be difficult to break. Hang in there, folks. I've got an example to show you shortly. So as a result, we end up buying things that our previous selves never needed to feel happy or fulfilled. So that's the Diderot effect. Dennis Diderot back in the 17th century, or is that the 18th century? 1769, regrets from my old dressing here. So there's a blog that James has done. It's a really good one. We'll put a link in the show notes, what that looks like. But he, he did an example of how he recently bought a new car and ended up purchasing all sorts of additional things to go inside it. Bought a tire pressure gauge, a car charger for the cell phone, an extra umbrella, a first aid kit, a pocket knife, a flashlight, emergency blankets, and even a seatbelt cutting tool. Um, allow me to point out that I owned my previous car for nearly 10 years, and at no point did I feel that any of the previously mentioned items were worth purchasing. <laughs> And yet after getting my shiny new car, I found myself falling into the same consumption spiral as Diderot. All right, so happens to the best of us. Here's some other areas. You buy a new dress and now you have to get shoes and earrings to match. Or you can buy a new couch and suddenly you're questioning the layout of your entire living room. Those chairs, that coffee table, that rug, they all got to go. So why am I telling you about the Diderot effect, Ben? Well, one of our previous summer series guests, Brendan Deeth, wrote in to me and you um, with, and I'm going to put a link in um, to Brendan's uh, Summer Series podcast, but he wrote uh, a, what I felt was a very brave and authentic and transparent experience um, that speaks to the Diderot effect. So I'm going to read out uh, what Brendan said to us. I wanted to send you through some thanks and encouragement to you all as I believe what I owe to you. Without the Money Smarts part of your more platform, my family would be under financial stress and forced selling would have likely occurred. Oh, nice backstory. Here's the longer story. In 2021, we did a full renovation of our house thanks to government grants, sufficient savings, excellent lending, and the recommendation from Joel in their property portfolio discussions. Uh, we had an excellent builder who was a good friend of theirs, and I was fortunate enough to take 12 weeks long service and work on most of the project with him. It was an eye-opening experience and an experience I'll never forget. The end of the Reno story is we have our dream home and no regrets slash missed opportunities with the build. 18 months since moving back in, we are thankful daily for the house we are blessed to have. Ben, I know you said it's renova uh, renovating is death by a thousand decisions. I fully agree. My line is it's like giving yourself the biggest headache, but it's totally worth it. There was a human psychology part of our renovation story that I've since reflected on it and is the meat and potatoes of my message to you. The Diderot effect, thanks James Clear, got us good. Ah, now we know why I'm talking about the Diderot effect, Ben. <laughs> I had no idea how this spiral of consumption could grab us from our humble, simple way of living to make us determined to upgrade, install anything we could and at all the cost of, a save, of our savings buffers. We moved from conservative spenders to a couple that happily dropped thousands on things that we had to have because you only renovate once. We ate into our defensive cash buffers like a knife through butter. Also, we could have better bench tops, smart lighting, solid doors, etc. It was a wild time of spending and it's clear that my wife and I were infected with the Diderot effect. Fast forward to the beginning of 2022. We're maxed out in debt with next to no cash and I'm thinking, right, now's the right time to update more and trap that surplus so we could build up that missing cash buffer. Well, you can imagine the sinking feeling when inflation and interest rate hit us like a freight train. By July, our Money Smarts monthly surplus was now in deficit. Q increased heart rate, cold sweats, and negative thoughts that were hard to shake off. The money discussions with, with my wife were difficult, and at times, ir irrational thoughts surfaced. But common sense always prevailed, and we logged into more and tightened the purse strings. Each month went by, and more and more fat was trimmed from our discretionary spending so that we'd always be running a household surplus. It's been a highly difficult ride for our family as we've assessed what is necessary for us to function. But as I sit here 12 months later, I am grateful for our family's grit and determination to see these tough times through. I'm also grateful and indebted to you guys for the more platform as well as your level-headed and informative messages to the TPC community. As I said above, without you guys and more, we would have forced sold our beautiful new home that we worked so incredibly hard for. Thank you. Keep up the TPC goal, guys. After my six years of listening, you're still my number one podcast to dial up. Ben, the Diderot effect is real. It happens to people, and that happened to one of our very own summer series guests, Brendan Deeth. 
Mate, it's happened to me recently, right? I've, I've joined a golf club for oh. the very, very first time. And, and I had golf sticks that were probably 20 years old. But of course, I needed new golf clubs, don't I? And then yeah. last week, I had to go down to drum and golf and also get myself a set of drivers because I didn't have, I got the irons first. And now, so yeah, it's, it's only glove. a natural experience that I look, you know, of course, I wear a glove. Did um, you get a new one? Yeah, well, I didn't get a new one this time. I've got a couple of old ones that I've built up over time. But it's a perfect example of, um, you know, resetting yourself and and spending that. So I've, you know, it's probably you know three or th- three or four thousand dollars worth of new golf clubs um, in addition to the membership um, that I've also taken out. So I I can completely concur that we are all susceptible uh, to that particular story. Now, did I need brand new? Could I have got secondhand clubs? Um, you know, uh, that that is also true. Did I shop on eBay? Did I do any of that stuff? No, I didn't. I ultimately went out and bought new ones. So again, I could have made those sacrifices um, if the if uh, needed. Um, but fortunately for me, um, I'm doing this now at the end of my wealth creation journey. Um, but that's a, a good example. And, and Brendan, thank you for sharing that very honest story around your current situation and, and how you've been able to pull through. Um, and it sounds like you're on the other side of that now. Um, and with a bit of luck, um, and hopefully, you know, next year and so forth, those surpluses will continue to grow. You get to retain your your beautiful home and ultimately you start to also focusing on building that passive income story. Yeah, and it sort of uh, flows on from last week, Ben, how we uh, had a topic around um, what happens if your buffer runs out, one of the questions that we covered, right? So um, uh, clearly we've got a situation here where we've gone from needs versus wants, um, essential yeah. versus discretionary and to help yeah. get back on track with that cash buffer. So there are things that uh, you can do if you're finding yourself in that situation. You can see here from Brendan that they were looking down the barrel of selling their dream home. They've gone to imagine that you go to all that effort to put oh. everything in and all of a sudden you find yourself in a credit squeeze that you actually have to move it on. Um, I'm so incredibly excited that that story had a happy ending because it, because it easily couldn't have. But at least if you didn't know what the Diderot effect was, probably most people can relate to it, Ben, but at least they know there's a there's a term from it. And it was, <clears throat> I'll talk about it a bit more in my life hack, but it was, it all started because Dennis Diderot received a beautiful new gown um, that made everything else um, look not so good, right? And if you remember, his essay was entitled Regrets for My Old Dressing Gown. Um let me let me circle back to that in the life hack so that you can see why the title of that is regrets from the old dressing gown. And we're going to be touching through it in terms of the misbusting stuff that we're talking about today. Like mm. ultimately, um, wealth creation is a story of trade offs and judgment calls and making those types of decisions. So you're going to see that also show up in some of the myths that we talk about today. So beautiful segue into the uh, the central theme of the show, Bryce. So let's rip into it. So for those people who don't understand, we have a, a planning team. Their goal, typically they come in and because we've written a book, Ben, that says we want to retire on $2,000 a week, typically someone will walk in and talk to the team and say, hey, listen, can you show me how to retire on $2,000 a week? And the team does that, right? And w- when when I put the, the challenge out to them, they were very quick to put their hands up and say, here's, here's a few that I think would be helpful for people to better understand. The first one, the first myth is... Equity equals borrowing capacity. Um, so the big question here is equity um, alone, does that actually equal um, borrowing capacity? And the answer is, uh, if, if we were back in the 80s, Ben, um, when Bond and Scase were around, maybe. Uh, if you're back in the early noughties, um, when there was a lot of easy access to cash done basically on assets, um, yes. But as we record here in 2023, um, equity alone is does not equal borrowing capacity. And the reason we bring that is because a lot of people come in to um, have those conversations and they say, but I've got heaps of equity. Why can't I actually borrow more money? Is because there's a bit more to it, Ben. There is. And, and the, look, the backstory is really simple. Um, when we got responsible lending legislation that came through, as more and more mortgage brokers were entering the market, there was low docs, no docs. Um, and there was this perception that if you had assets or security, the banks would just give you money. And that's all you needed to worry about. There didn't need to be any type of uh, assessment around how you were to be able to service that mortgage. So um, that killed off that particular story. Um, and if we or we all remember the 
the GFC, which was created by, you know, collateralised debt obligations. It was created by quants in the background, you know, through all of the hedge funds that they were building and they were leveraging leveraging themselves to the Scheitenhausen. So ultimately, that is the backstory in terms of um, where we got to that story. So what we all now need to understand from a traditional lending point of view in terms of prime lending and even subprime lending in a lot of cases, the vast majority of the cases, you can't lend just against the asset over the medium to longer term. Um, you can still hunt down things like uh, security, uh, legal funds and a few other areas where they may lend on assets, but that is very expensive money um, and ultimately it's very risky in doing something like that. So we just take a simple view here to keep it simple for our community that ultimately when you look at equity, it doesn't mean that a bank's going to give you any borrowings. Yeah, because serviceability is the biggest obstacle facing um, property investors right now, given that you've got a buffer rate, that interest rate's moving at a buffer rate of 3% on top of that. So um, that is that is the that is the biggest message that the team wanted to share with the community is that um, don't confuse the fact that you've got a lot of assets to um, automatically turn that into lending. And, you know, you hear a lot of narrative around the fact that um, buffer rates, mortgage shard, if you've been listening to us, but it's not until you actually go and try and implement this stuff yourself and then go to the bank and try and get access to the cash that you realise this is a real thing, right? So it's it's kind of um, uh, a good timely reminder for us, Ben, to to talk about what, what does the bank actually look for? Um <laughs> When they um, when they determine what you can lend, so um, there's a few things, but it's been summarised by all the C's. Ben, is it five C's? Is it six C's? We're going to run through that. But the first one uh, is character, which uh, the first C of borrowing is character. Um, so it refers to your personal circumstances, which is um, you know, is there a credit history they need to be concerned about? Is have you been in your employment for a long period of time? Have you st- um, have you changed jobs regularly or have you moved houses regularly? It's kind of sort of getting a bit of a sense of who you are as a credit risk. Um, so hence the hence the character, right? So they look at payment history and how, have you ever been um, bankrupt um, before? Anything like that they want to know um, because they've got to make an assessment based on some application forms and a little bit of data about who you are uh, as, a, as a human. We know they know who you are as some data on a piece of paper, but they want to have a look at that first to see. Hmm, if we're going to we're going to lend this money, are you a credible risk for us to take? Are you a reliable money manager? Um, can we show the? Can you show us the evidence of that? Um, and are you generally reliable? In other words, you're not moving jobs every five minutes. So that character um, is really about assessing that um, in terms of passing through that gate to then look at the uh, the second C which is really around the capacity story. Now, this is what we were talking before about equity versus borrowing power. Capacity to be able to repay that loan over the longer term. So this is referring to the borrower's ability to repay the loan based on their income expenses and other financial obligations. It's really simple to understand that that's what we're talking about when we talk about capacity, isn't it, Bryce? Yeah, debt to income ratios, what percentage of your of your overall take home is going towards um, loan repayments, all that sort of stuff. So that's probably the easiest to see of them all. Um, the next one is capital, which is essentially, um, depending on on the debt, because you and I had this conversation when we were chatting about the five C's and there was a little, there's a little, oh, in my training, there was this one. And when I was looking into it, it was this. One. So we're going to do the six C's, but the, generally it's the five C's. But the first one is capital, right? Yep. Which is largely... Um, what do you offer as security for the loan in terms of your overall portfolio? So not just the LVR, which is the other C, which is collateral. Um, it's what does your overall picture look like? So the bank's going to say, okay, what LVR are we going to put against this property? Is it 80%? Is it 85 Is it 90 Is it 95 And they'll make that assessment. But they're also going to look at, do you own your own home? Do you have other assets? Um what other resources do you have to suggest that you are a good credit risk for this? So um, something else that the bank's looking to, Ben. Yeah, and I think um, in these times, um, it's this has come to prominence probably since responsible lending really took took a hold, that a, a strong balance sheet it effectively, you know, so if you've got, again, to Bryce's point, um, 100000 plus in 
household contents. Um, if you've got uh, maybe a boat or some other types of assets, cars and that type of thing. So it's demonstrated over a period of time that you've been able to build up assets. And that is, you know, in terms of that capital story, how much super do you have? Because ultimately, if something was to go wrong, um, you know, what what is that strength of the deal is effectively what that overall balance sheet position looks like. So when, when you do do your financial position statement as part of your application, um, always make sure that you're adding all of those things that are of high value um, that, that makes your balance sheet look really strong um, is the tip there when it comes to, uh, to capital. So we've got character, we've got capacity, we've got capital and collateral. Capital being overall, um, what's your asset base? The collateral being uh, what sort of LVR you're going to put up on the property. Um, another C is condition. So it's kind of the terms and conditions of the loans. So before, for before, I, before we jump into that, in terms of the collateral story, I want to I want to double click on that one. Sorry, I, I was mainly focused in on capital there. Collateral is really important because the the security that is going to be actually pinned to the loan is what that relates to. So it's really important to understand that some lenders may have an issue with certain types of collateral. We've talked a lot about that in terms of the types of securities, whether they be company title, stratum title, all different types of complex titles. Some banks don't have an appetite for that, um, you know, size, um, the number of exposures that they have in a high density, uh, the square meterage sizes. So collateral really matters. You can think, well, I'm servicing a loan, I've got a good balance sheet, I've got good character, and then you pick an asset that they just go, you know what, we just don't have an appetite to lend against this because there's really big risk in that. So that's where, again, the value of an investment savvy broker can take you through the steps around, you know, what are the main things I need to look for with regards to that type of collateral that is ultimately going to be the security um, that is that is connected to the mortgage loan that you're about to get. It's a good point. It's uh, quickly summarised by saying buy buy properties that banks like. <laughs> yes, that's exactly right. <laughs> don't buy properties that banks don't like. So think about stuff that's next to high voltage power lines next door. Think of um, holiday lets where the, um, the the lack of control. Think of anything the bank goes all red flag. That's probably a good sign. So um, yeah, that's a good footnote on that one, Ben. So thank you. Conditions. Um, so just terms and conditions of the loan, interest rates, repayment periods, any other fees and charges. So um, will you have the ability to, to meet those conditions of the loan? Yeah, it's, this one, again, really super important. You could have three different lenders with three different credit policies. And so conditions refers to credit policy. Um, and some lenders will accept casual employment. Some lenders will accept one year self-employed employment. Um, others won't take into consideration probation periods, bonuses, um, you know, uh, commissions that are being earned. So conditions, and again, if, you, if, you, if I refer this back to the skill set of an investment savvy broker, we are absolutely, this is the subject matter knowledge that gives them the ability to do all the shopping for you. So if they're not very good, at their product knowledge in terms of exactly the specifications of each of the different loans and conditions of those loans, then you're not gonna get the best optimized outcome for your circumstances. So that is ultimately why you're engaging with an investment savvy broker, because this condition story, this credit policy story is super critical. So we've got character, capacity, capital, collateral conditions, and Ben, common sense. Yeah, I think the way in which I was taught when I did my diploma and, and I got my qualifications as a broker, um, the common sense approach, and I, and I use a good example here, um, and I think I've used this before on the pod many, many, many years ago. Um, so I'm a new migrant to the country, um, but I'm, I'm actually a computer scientist. So I'm, a, I'm an engineer, I'm a computer coder. Now, th those jobs are in high demand at the moment. And so I've demonstrated, you know, when I was living overseas, that I've got really good capacity and long, long employment history as a computer programmer. And then I come to Australia and I've just got my first job and I'm three months into that job. I'm highly paid. Um, and so, but now I may not meet the conditions and the, and the credit policy of that lender, but through common sense, I'm able to put up a proposal to that lender and say, under all of these circumstances, really strong savings, really strong servicing capacity, 
um, this would be a really good client that this bank would really enjoy having on their books. And ultimately, that's the common sense approach. So that's when, again, an investment savvy broker would be able to have a conversation with a credit uh, credit officer at the bank and say, here, I've got this, I've got this deal. Um, I'm putting this scenario to you. Um, will you accept it? And they'll go, or based on the balance, and, and obviously once we vet it, if that all sounds true, yes, we will do an exception outside of policy. And that's why we refer to it as a common sense approach when you've got those, um, you know, those deals that don't fall completely um, into the right, uh, you know, they're, they're, maybe they're a rectangle into a square hole. And so they basically massage them so they do get through that square hole and that, that loan gets approved. So there you go, folks. We just talked through the six C's. So why why is that important? Well, the 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 myth that we're busting here today is that equity equals borrowing capacity. And the fact is that equity equals part of the borrowing capacity story. It 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 talks to the capital component, which means that you as an asset base is fine. Uh, it talks to the collateral component because if you're buying the, the right property that the banks like and you're buying it at an LVR that's within their, their realm and within the um, 20% ba- um, balance from your own resources, fine. But it doesn't go and cover character, capacity, conditions or common sense. So they're, they're super important. So if you're thinking, sure, uh, I would like to buy investment properties and you're thinking it's all about equity, hopefully uh, we've squashed that for you. Myth number one. Uh, equity equals borrowing capacity, not true. Definitely not true. And Bryce, if I can just put some icing on that cake, spending, we haven't really, you know, we've used the five C's, but, you know, capacity is about how much you're also spending. So even if you don't have really strong income, um, your your spending is also going to have a really big material impact on your servicing and your borrowing capacity. So just be mindful of that. Um, you know, there there are minimum levels um, that lenders will assess on. But if you keep to those minimum levels, your borrowing capacity, because remember, equity doesn't equal borrowing capacity. What does equal borrowing capacity is income less spending. Um, so that's a really an, another important message as part of busting this first myth. All right, brilliant. Okay, so the second myth uh, that the team wanted us to talk about, Ben, is... Um, uh, do you do you actually need five plus properties to live your lifestyle by design? Um, now you and I have talked about this um, a fair bit over the journey. We talk about it in our um, in our masterclass. We go into to, to length on this. So if you haven't checked that out, go and check it out. We'll, we'll put a link in the uh, show description. Um, but Ben. When, <laughs> I don't know about you, but when we were when we were early days, we were researching. It seemed like every magazine, um, and a lot of them have gone out now, so there's no magazines left. But it was always telling the story of the outlier, yeah. where someone had, you know, ten properties, or they'd renovated or subdivided, or they just there was lots of active or lots of big accumulation um, portfolios. You and I personally know a lot of people in the industry who have got very, very large portfolios. And so they get all the um, uh, the attention. But but the reality is um, that the answer to that question depends on a couple of things. Um, yeah. when, when you started, how much you need to retire and um, your, your, your lever levels, the time target income and expense levers. So there there isn't a one size fits all answer here, but there is a bit of, um, there is a bit of icing on this, Ben, to offer hope for a lot of people, isn't there? Yeah, there, it really is simple. Um, there has been a lot of changes in the eight years that we've been doing this podcast. And so some of the new models that we're building, obviously, probably prices are a lot more expensive than what they were eight years ago when we first did that. In fact, even some of the notes in our book in terms of the recommendations we give around the capital strategies and the, and the income strategies inside those books, um, you know, those prices in there that you'll be reading today, you'll be like, well, what's where can I find properties of that sort of price ilk? So mm. it's really clear that there's a couple of really important things that have happened. Um, so we can now, depending on when you, you know, your timing, uh, with a couple of properties and also the increase in superannuation minimum contributions, um, is going to see that uh, the $100,000 target is going to be even more achievable for most households. And that's really exciting for us because at the end of the day, we're going to ultimately measure our community on the number of people that achieve financial peace. Remember our seven grades of financial well-being? It's those, it's the measurement and the movement of those people um, that we are taking through our more platform that will ultimately 
judge the purpose and the impact that the property couch has made and the community that we've built. So I'm really excited by the fact that that means more people, more of the bell curve, the middle average Australians have a real opportunity to, to allow themselves to buy a couple of investment properties in addition to their superannuation to allow them to retire very comfortably. And that excites me a lot. And you know that's why we do why, what we do, Bryce. It is. And um, when we talked about three to four properties in the back catalogue of properties, they were lots, they were lots um, uh, smaller in price as well. So now if you buy two at, uh, sorry, one at 800,000, back then that was the same as buying two yeah. at 400,000. So we've got to remember that, um, that, that property prices don't wait for anyone. Um, and it also, um, to your point, you might only need one or two plus your super. Um, so uh, what happens is the team uh, have f- fed it back to us that people come in and they go, well, what do you mean we only need one property? What do you need? We only need two properties. The boys on the podcast always talk about three to four. Well, there's a couple of things that you can think about that depending on what is it that you want to achieve in retirement. So you might want to drop back to part-time in your 50s. Um and enjoy more lifestyle freedom, right? Um, or you might want to leave a bigger legacy um, after you um, uh, to pass on to your kids and you might need to retire a bit later. So it all, all depends on what you want. Do you want to be debt-free in retirement um, versus do you not want to be debt-free in retirement? So you might buy three or four or six or 10 properties. That's fine. And the asset base keeps accumulating over time due to compounding. But given the nature of your income, you might not be able to retire out that debt. So you might still be able to get $2,000 per week in the portfolio, but still carrying debt. So the big question is, do I want to be carrying debt um, when I'm in retirement or do I want the peace of having no debt or having an offset account that matches the amount of debt that I have? So these are the questions that need to be answered, which is which is a combination of three to four might be okay. Uh, three to four back in 2016 is different to three to four uh, back in 2023. Um, what do I actually want? Um, what does my 50s look like? Do I want to work later? There's a whole bunch of stuff going on here. So so we want, we want to break the myth um, once and for all that five plus properties is generally um, the, um, the outlier. We're normally getting three to four. And now more of late, we're getting one or two um, is the case. So if you're getting 2,000 a week and you're fully retired out and you only need two properties, well done, great. That's all you need. Um, but if you start a bit later or you've got more of an aggressive plan or you want um, bigger goals for um, intergenerational wealth, well, you may go and get three or four. But the point being is um, don't be surprised if it's only one or two. You've got to start with a plan. It's really simple. And then there are going to be some judgment calls and trade-offs as part of that plan. And then effectively, when you're working through those models, it's all around optimize- optimization. So if you're optimizing, um, we might be able to fit three really good properties in there. But if your expectations are realistic, that's even better in terms of how we're able to do that. And that's why every household's completely unique in terms of their circumstances. So we, we really do focus in on knowing your numbers and understanding basically, you know, what is for today and what goals do you want to achieve in the short, medium term? And then ultimately over the long term, and it's how much you're allocating today versus how much you're allocating for your future you, right? Because that is that is the story here. So that's why making the invisible visible really does give you that line of sight that you're looking for. And so to the point, the myth is you don't need five. You may only need a couple. Um, and, you know, the other big takeaway we want, you know, to pass on to you is start now. Start now. Like, you know, if everyone said, well, when's the best time to start? Well, of course, the earlier you start, the better. But if, if you're listening to this and you're in your late 30s or early 40s, start now. You can't mm. start, you know, you can't go back in time. So start now. But start to think about those types of things in terms of, all right, what is my discretionary spending? What am I spending on bills? What am I putting away for tomorrow? Where are my loan commitments in terms of what are those costs and those holding costs that are associated with what I'm trying to do? Get line of sight on those and optimize. And that's mm. all, all that we try and help you do is take action and then optimize those decisions and obviously have some defense around that. That's our job as educators and, and people who are helping guide you. Yeah, and our definition of freedom is um, getting your time back, 
um, spending more time with the people that you love, um, planning um, planning into more experiences. It's it's certainly not any um, textbook uh, trappings of wealth. Um, that's that's not what we're about. So, which is why um, uh, people can be surprised that it, that it only needs yeah. to be a handful of properties. In some cases, one. In some cases, two. Uh, I remember Martin Richardson. We've got a, uh, a a video of him on our website, Ben, um, where he came in and he was just shocked that once once we came to, to talk to Joel, Joel said, "You're done. Just keep doing what you're doing. Retire at the debt. Nothing." And he's like, "I don't need to buy another property." And the answer was no. You, you don't need to buy another property. So I think it's a good reminder for everyone to to realize that the game is to get your time back. The game is to actually have some form of lifestyle design around you um, having choice. And we we break up um, expense categories into four, right? So it's discretionary spend, um, bills and spending, loan payments and investment costs. They're the four broad categories, right? So if you know what your discretionary spend is each week, each month, and you know what your bills and spending are on all of your fixed utilities, that's really that's really the starting point to work out how much you actually need. Because if you if you've been uh, in a position where you can retire out all your debt, the kids have left home, there's no more school fees, there's all that stuff during accumulation phase that's no longer the case when you get to the latter part of life. Um, well, loan payments should be zero. And if you've and if you've done it correctly and done some planning, had a bit of a look, and you can see that your investment costs at the very least are self funding. Um, but but over time with no debt. Um, that is a minimal. Well, if if you know what your discretion, your bill spending is, you know how much money you need to live. You know you actually know what lifestyle by design looks like because that's the number. That's the very first point that people should make, Ben. So they know why. How much do I actually need? It's it's the sum of those two things. <laughs> well said, mate. Well said. So, folks, uh, the myth number two was you need five plus properties to live your lifestyle by design. Uh, we want to break that myth. We're going to let you know. In some cases, it'll be one. But typically, it'll probably be somewhere between one and four, depending on your ambition, your time, your risk profile, and your appetite for debt retirement when you're in retirement. Um, that's it. Um, but it might be one. It doesn't need to be five plus, despite what you read uh, for all the outliers. All right, Ben, myth number three, uh, rent vesting is a magic wand. Um the team, the team were really animated about um, uh, chatting to us um, to, uh, about this particular one because you get a lot of people who actually think it's a panacea for, oh, I, I'll actually just use it for a little while um, and then w- later on I might pivot. But, but, but someone who chooses a place to live in and spend their money elsewhere is making a conscious decision to say the big rock in the jar that is required for me to buy my own Rocky Pie residence, which takes a lot of resources and a lot of planning and need to bring it into the into the picture as early as possible because I'm the only one paying it off. It's usually high servicing. And the more and more I delay it, the more and more expensive it gets. So if it's hard now, it gets harder later. Um, so if that's a deliberate strategy where you've decided I want all of the things that come with rent vesting, which is flexibility and not being locked in and being able to be in the suburb that I like and invest a bit more in my lifestyle while still investing, that is fine. But the message is really clear that it is not something that you can easily change midstream. In fact, it's quite difficult to change midstream. It is. And um, so what we're referring to is the pure form of rent vesting, which is this concept that you know, right throughout the course of building wealth through property, you will continually keep renting um, and you will allow yourself to build multiple properties inside that portfolio and that will complement the fact that you don't have an owner-occupied home. What we are seeing um, in this evolution of this concept of rent vesting is there's now a sort of second tier um, sort of promotion around what rent vesting is where people are basically saying, yeah, just go off and buy an investment property, uh, rent where you want to live in a city or whatever and still have fun with your friends, um, and then ultimately um, either sell that property uh, to go and buy a new home. And so we don't we, we don't talk about that in the purest form of rent vesting. What we say about that is effectively, yeah, I mean, you know, if I'm single but I have aspirations of one day partnering up and maybe even aspirations of, of having a family, um, then I want my money working as hard as I can for me because I absolutely know that 
saving a deposit for a home is very difficult. And I absolutely know that I want to live in a certain location with like-minded people, and that's a little bit more expensive and a little bit more out of my reach. So people have a choice with what they do with that money. They can invest it in shares, they can put it in term deposits, and some people actually invest it in property. And and from our point of view, if you're single and you're in your early 20s uh, or mid 20s and you've got a really good income, um, that is potentially a sensible thing to do if you've got a five to seven year horizon. And if that property performs really well, um, and then during that five to seven years, you do find a partner, then you've got double household income potentially, and all of a sudden your, your world of options open up more, you can then make a decision around what you do with that property. And so that's a game where you come and, you know, I did plenty of these types of plans where I started with a single person. We did an original property portfolio plan or a property plan. And then four or five years later, we're coming back in and say, hi, meet Joan or hi, meet John. And then ultimately we've got, okay, great. We've got two household incomes. What's the pathway that we're going to travel down here? And in some cases, we were able to retain that original investment property, use the equity that we had, but then go and buy a family home. So that is again a classic case of that's not a pure rent investor, that's just someone who had a, a window of five to seven years about maximizing their return on their money and they've taken that pathway um, as opposed to someone who's just used property investment in the short term to create a short term return and then basically do that. So. I'm really clear about what pure rent vesting is. And to Bryce's point, that is where if you want to undo all of that work, um, there's one important understanding that's going to be very expensive. And you may have taken four steps forward, but you're probably going to take at least two steps back. And so that's why that's just a lot of wasted money and time and effort. So if someone is built, if we're building a pure rent vesting plan for someone, They've got to be in it for the long term because the reality is, and we see this a lot when we do the models, is we may not be able to chase down that beautiful big home in that lovely location that you want to live in um, and retain all of those properties. And so that is the trade-off and judgment call that gets made in the planning stages. And ultimately, if you then change your mind, um, there are significant financial consequences to that. Yeah, I, th I think that's the point, Ben, where someone, uh, and, and this is the feedback from the team, right, where someone's come in and said, I have this, I have this ambition for this dream home. And, and, and the feedback is, well, right now you can't afford it. Mm. And they're like, cool, no problem. I'll go rent vesting and then we'll do it later. So that sounds all right. You kick it down the can. Whereas if it's a pure lifestyle play and people want the, like what we talked about before, they don't see the the benefit of um, investing in their own home. They want the flex. That's fine. That's one path. But it's it's more the path where, the, where someone goes, okay, let's do that. And then f for, for some reason thinking that, well, later on your borrowing capacity will be um, limited. The, the house will actually cost um, uh, a, a lot more and you have less time to get on top of the debt before you retire. And then if you have to sell the properties to actually then be able to buy the principal place of residence where you've got CGT, then you have to start the investment property journey all over again. So it's the idea is it's not a magic wand to be able to get you into your dream home just because you've invested. It, it, it may do, but the ultimate um, uh, suggestion here is you may be limiting the amount of borrowing capacity you have by loading up the portfolio. And equally, um, when you're in retirement, um, you, you will want a roof over your head. That is uh, the people who have, uh, and it, uh, rent investors can still steal it, Ben, if they've accumulated enough assets, that's fine, that's pure. But if it's just a play around getting the dream home, you still will need that roof over your head. And the people that we've observed who, who do struggle in retirement are the ones that don't have the security of being in their own place uh, at that critical time when their income either drops off or is at a minimum. Yeah, I think that sort of, so the pure rent investor probably has a market size of around five to 10% maximum. To your point, obviously when you are in retirement, um, you, you know, your principal place of residence as we currently record this um, is exempt from any asset test, uh, any means testing. Um, whereas all your investment properties aren't gonna be um, exempt of those types of things as well. So now if you build up a big enough wealth base, you're not probably worried about pensions or any other sort of government assistance. And, and we 
absolutely believe that you shouldn't, you know, be, be having faith or trust in the government to be able to have money for you in the future. Um, we believe that, you know, aspiring Australians just get on doing it and build their wealth and, and ultimately expect the government to take some of that back in taxes um, if they do it really, really well. That's the system that we live in. So my message around that, and I think to, you know, some of the feedback we got from Amanda, and Amanda who's one of our great um, advisors as well, was, and I saw this when I was doing my models, is that sometimes you just can't chase down that that blue chip, you know, sort of lifestyle by design dream home because it's it's running quicker than you can actually get there. And I think that is when when you show those models and, and you're showing the scenarios where it's hard to chase that down, all of a sudden the idea of working really hard and being quite disciplined and diligent around spending in the next year or two to then get into that location um, and a lot, what a lot of people will do is they'll look at, um, uh, you know, basically getting land in that location and then looking to improve that asset. We saw Brendan's story before in terms of the renovations that they're doing. So that's the other way in which we can then model uh, for those types of clients to sort of say, well, well that gets you in at the, at the entry level in that location. But we know that ultimately at some point you might put an extension on that home or, or do what you need to do. So it doesn't... Um, you know, reduce your ability to actually get into that market, but they are the types of trade-offs and decisions that need to be made. And the earlier you go after that dream home and put that big rock in the jar, uh, the better you'll be served. And and it also, again, highlights that if you do want to get your money working harder for you and, you, and use leverage into an investment for the next three to five years, if you're in your early 20s uh, or mid 20s and you want to build up some, some better returns, we're also saying that's plausible as well, especially if you're single um, in terms of doing it. But even if you're a couple and you've got really good income coming in, that first step on the property ladder can still be really good for you and it doesn't have to be your ultimate step. Um, I would also say, Bryce, in, you know, having done thousands of these plans across our team, um, it really is quite uh, uh, important to understand. A lot of people think the property investment plans are just about buying two or three investment properties. They are not. They are about buying the, you know, working where the dream home, you know, that, that future home lives and then how it's best optimised to put the assets or the other investment properties around that one as well. So that, that is the, that's why we continually say each household is different and each, each plan is completely tailored to the circumstances and goals of what that household is trying to achieve. Yeah, to that point, Ben, it's actually easy to get in the market. It's hard to stay in the market, yeah. right? So I think that's what the plan does the most because it actually says, well, all right, you bought an investment property, no problem, but can you keep it? Because <laughs> there's all these things that are coming up for you, um, kids, yeah. school decisions, upgrade the exactly. car, renovating. So can you get in the market and can you stay in the market? Because that's the game, right? So I think the summary for this myth here is um, asking yourself the question, are you all in or not at all? Um, am I all in on rent vesting uh, or is it just not for me, right? Because the alternative is um, being half in. And I think the motivation for being half in on this one is is as a magic wand for being able to eventually get the dream home that we're after. Chances are if you can't afford it now, uh, it's going to be harder, not impossible, but harder if you kick the can down the track. So myth three, rent vesting as a magic wand. Hopefully we've crushed that myth, Ben. Love it. Uh, myth number four is an interesting one, Ben, because you and I have seen this a lot, right? But okay, here it is. Higher incomes equals good money management. Um, true or false? Well, the answer is um, it's not an automatic lock. There is no direct correlation between high income and good money management. In fact, my observation over the journey, Ben, is there's a lot of there's a lot of good money managers with a good income, but I've seen them far too many times where people use their 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 high incomes to cover the fact that they're not good money managers because they make decisions uh, can be a little loose. Next month, another big pay ch um, uh, pay packet hits their account, and they go, "Phew, lucky that was the case." Um, otherwise, they'd be in all sorts of trouble. Whereas people who don't have higher incomes, have to be more purposeful and more meaningful and more mindful around where their money goes. They're more um, more likely to, not always, but more likely to have to stick to uh, some form of system, some form of budget, um, because they don't have the same luxury of being able to uh, get themselves out of trouble. So my observation is high income um, often means high lifestyle, 
but it doesn't mean good money management and it doesn't mean wealth accumulation. Well, it also comes back to the themes that we've been talking about in terms of keeping up with the Joneses. You know, what, what higher income equals is more choice. And unfortunately, more choice can lead to more temptations. Um, and, you know, when you've got the luxury of that high income, um, you can potentially, you know, justify irrational um, spending behaviour in the short term. And to, to your point, Bryce, that's ultimately what we do see in terms of um, the majority of high income households, um, that they, they very much can be for today and not for tomorrow. And so if you just did the math on your own incomes that are coming in and you've got 40 years of working time, you're going to work out that you're, you're going to earn millions, millions and millions of dollars, probably these days in excess of five or $6 million for the typical household. And so it's the choices that you make over that journey in terms of what actually is going to be left over. And so the biggest observation we see in the planning team, the property planning team is that there is this real expectation that they're going to have the same amount of income when they retire as what they've been enjoying when they've been working. And that is just factually so far from the truth once we show them the model. So if they've enjoyed household income of $200,000 a year and they're expecting that that's going to be you know, consistent with what they have in retirement, it's simply wrong. Um, and you know, you only need to look at the wealth speed um, gauges inside more when you're having a look at passive income versus you know working income speeds. That exertion income, if you if you were to take that out and have a look at just at your passive income, well, that's that's really what you've got to build up because the moment that you do retire, we turn off that income, that working income, mm -hmm. and ultimately you're then left to the accumulation of assets and the income that those assets are actually producing for you. So it's a real risk. Um, and it's and that's why we want to definitely bust this myth, because uh, a lot of people don't have this awakening until they hit their early 50s and go, mm -hmm. well, I've sort of become accustomed to this sort of lifestyle, Bryce, and uh, I want to be able to continue this lifestyle. And then they start taking greater risks to try and get in increased returns and can shoot themselves in the foot. And, you know, then they have regret and frustration, the whole thing comes down like a, a stack of cards. So for me, um, this one's a, you know this one's the one I'm most power passionate about in, in terms of we can all learn income. It's what we choose to do with that income that is going to define our futures. And so for me, I want to make sure that people understand it is a choice. It is absolutely a choice in terms of what you do today versus what you put away for tomorrow. Lifestyle by design comes from wealth, Ben. It doesn't come from income. So, because uh, income is really fleeting. Just, I mean, just think of a professional athlete. I mean, how many do we want to rattle off? Those who are living at high during their um, their peak period and then um, having to go and take a job um, that is well below what they've got. So that's the, that's the most um, typical example. If you're someone who's on a high income and you think it can't happen to you, just think of them. Uh, someone who's earning a very good income can still be in financial difficulty, whereas someone on a lower income can still be well on their way to being wealthy. Yeah. So it, it, there's there's no um, discrepancy. And I mean, people who are um, spending everything they earn, they're not building wealth. And in some cases, they're actually spending more than they earn. So therefore, they're reducing their wealth. So um, it's not the income that creates the wealth. It's the ability to save that creates the wealth or the ability to put it into something where you're accumulating rather than spending. So this is a big one. I reckon it's the biggest adjustment that people need to make. They come in and they've got a lot invested in their lifestyle. Um, I remember having a conversation with a doctor who was on, I don't know, let's call it six or 700,000. And I said, where did your money go? I don't know. Like, what do you mean? Oh, well, I went to Bali two weeks ago for a couple of weeks and then I was in the snow, you know, so it's, but they, he just genuinely could not let me know where it was. So I think they've got the biggest um they've got the biggest adjustment to make right because those those who are on higher incomes without the intention because i think it's about intention not income um so for people on higher incomes without intention there's lifestyle inflation there can be a lack of financial literacy because you have um well it'll just solve itself well if you, if you haven't put some time into that that just, sometimes it won't um you overspend on some luxury items you often over reliance on debt um you can sometimes have poor budgeting skills 
and therefore you, you're not really thinking about retirement. So um, uh, our team can get excited by the potential of someone who has a high income, but that can quickly be lulled when they have to realise there's a big paradigm shift to happen. There is there is a lot of stuff happening. I can remember Ben implementing the seven day float um, for the very first time many many moons ago. That that took. I reckon it took six to eight weeks to um, just iron out the kinks of just lazy, terrible decisions that were being made, and that's just the seven-day float. So if you're if you're used to, like I said, going to Bali, going skiing regularly, um, unwinding that takes time. I reckon that's a real big paradigm shift for a lot of people. I think one of the biggest observations for me, Bryce, when we, when I was dealing with, you know, I, I've had plenty of people who are on three hundred, four hundred, five hundred thousand, and they're great clients, and we love working with them. But because they're earning so much money, they really don't have a budget. They don't need to because, you know, their surplus is going up, but they just don't realise just how much of that money is being spent on the here and now as mm. opposed to what it could be doing for them. And then the mm. realisation when we when we have an honest conversation about you've got a certain lifestyle expectation, do you want to keep that lifestyle expectation in retirement? Well, I, yes, I've worked really hard. I've got a, you know, I've got a really good job. I mean, good income. All right, well, here's here's the line of sight. Here's what the model shows. And you're going to have a 50% reduction on the current income that you're earning. Whoa, 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 we need to do something about that. Yep, so let's go to that story now. Um, and we're going to that story. We're sort of saying, all right, so that means we've got to cut back on that spending story and we've got to start getting some discipline and we've got to build a model that, and, you know, and, and work into a hygiene. And that's obviously where the money smart shines because... It's a rules-based system. It's really easy to operate, and that's sort of how it plays out. So that's why we introduced that. Um, if I could make, a, you know, another sort of really clear observation around, you know, these particular stories is uh, I've had, uh, you know, people come in as well. Not a, not a huge number that is, but I've, I've got, uh, I've heard this story many times um, sitting in front of clients, which was um, my mate, he earns about 60% of what I earn. And he's got more wealth than I do. And, I'm, you know, I'm here now because I want to work out how he did it and how I can do it. And that is an honest conversation that people need to have And because it's really what's happening there is um, I, could, I can say, well, without even knowing you, mate, I reckon he's got less toys than you. Um, I reckon <laughs> that there's some sacrifices that they've been making um, because they, have, they earn less. And so ultimately that is true. So there is an, there is an honest conversation we need to have about this. The higher your income, the greater the wealth you can achieve, right? And then the compounding nature of that wealth makes it very difficult for those people on lower incomes to chase down. That's a fact, all right? The, but the fact is also, if you are on um, low to moderate incomes, you can still achieve financial peace and financial freedom. And so it's exciting to know that you've got that potential, Never, ever lose sight of the fact that you've got that potential and opportunity. It is, again, the choices that you make and the planning that you do that will ultimately decide whether that happens for you or not. Yeah, well said, Ben. I think um, my mess my final message on this myth is similar, right? It's like if you are on a good income, uh, get excited that you've got opportunity, right? If you're on the lower to moderate income, don't be discouraged no. because the people on higher incomes probably aren't going to manage it well. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. so you can get a bit discouraged because they're on the high incomes, but chances are that all, they, all they'll have their whole life is a great lifestyle um, and then it'll come to a screeching halt, whereas you, um, if you're on lower to moderate, you'll build the disciplines. I mean, it's the lotto winning story. It's the professional athletes. Yeah. It's like there is just... There is just so many stories of people who don't want. So if you're higher income, seize the opportunity. If you're not on a higher income, realize they probably won't seize the opportunity. <laughs> and you <laughs> should see, and you can still seize you that should. opportunity. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So there you go. All right. Myth number four was higher incomes equals good money management. We're breaking that. It is not correlated in any way, shape, or all right, final one we're going to cover today, Ben, is myth number five, is just a great expectation that things will just happen, right? So it's amazing how people come in to um, talk to the team and they just go, oh, yeah, well, I've got this I've got this dream for this future family home that I want, and it's almost like by osmosis that it's going to happen, but it, it won't. It's not just about equity. We've talked about that. 
it's about planning. We've talked about that, but here's here's where here's where a lot of the thought needs to be put into this, Ben. It's about crystal balling their future income, right? So uh, one of the, one of the examples um, is that you know if you can't afford it now, you're probably not going to be able to afford it in ten years' time because it's doubled in value, but Here's what happens if you go and you go and put in um, to the bank calculators and you say, my dream home is $2 million today. Go and actually have a look and see how much that loan payment is because um, that actually might sober you up because people say, well, I'm, I've quit my job. I've got this um, this business. This business is actually going to generate the income so they're actually going to do that. Once they've actually landed the plane on, well, what, what, is, what does that actually mean as a repayment? That can actually sober people up and the team have actually done that. So... Unless there is a significant increase um, in your income rather than just increasing with inflation, chances are some of these um, ideas might be works of fiction. As difficult as that is to say, and as difficult as that is to have those difficult conversations, um, and unless you're a graduate doctor um, who is going to have an income spike pretty quickly, if you're just like the rest of us who doesn't have that, um, uh, that spike, without more than just CPI inflation um, increases on your income, um, chances are some of these things might not come to fruition. Bryce, I, I, I really like this myth because from my point of view, um, and you know, again, I, I'm really fortunate, right? Obviously, we've got a team of advisors that I also get great feedback from, but I also did hundreds of these plans for years and years and years. And what one of the things I do realise when sitting in that seat was that the people who did come in, guess what? Most of them had a realisation and that that their, their expectations needed to be reset. But every now and then, um, there would be someone that would come in and their expectations were wildly over-exaggerated. I want, uh, I want a, a helicopter in Bali that will fly me to my villa in Bali and I want, the, you know, the holiday home. And, you know, they're just completely um, one step removed from the reality that they're dealing with. So what I refer to here is I'm probably talking to those people who are listening, and hopefully they're listening, about setting expectations. And I don't mind expectations because it's a dreaming form, right? So I, I do believe in, you know, the greatest Australian, aspiring Australian person having a go making a difference, creating their lifestyle by design. That's everything that is the essence that makes this country great and gives everyone that opportunity to live their lifestyle by design. What I'm talking about, though, is um, dreams are powerful to a point, um, and that is where you can potentially overextend the reality of those dreams, and then so you just need a truth session, right? And a truth-telling session for some people could be you're living outside of your means, you're overspending, and they are difficult conversations. They are hard conversations, and that's why most people who are in financial difficulty, um, it is really about that really tough conversation. But I want to talk to those people who just who have expectations that are beyond what might be capable for them. And, and so I'm talking to the everyday, the, you know, that ambitious Australian who has these amazing wild dreams, and 1% of those people might make that story but 99% of those people are going to come crashing down to reality. So we're talking about having a truth conversation right through this process um, when we are saying, here's your numbers, here's your model, here's what your lifestyle by design looks like, what are the scenarios that we want to build for you that can give you line of sight and make the invisible visible, um, and then you can be what you can see, right, in, in terms of that story. So um, that's why, you know, I, I really do think that setting expectations are healthy, uh, to a point, but if you've got you know outrageous expectations, then you're going to have to have a reality check at some point, um, because again, there's only a, a very very small percentage of people who have that sort of nosebleed um, exponential growth and build exponential wealth, um, uh, you know, and they will do anything to get there. Usually, we would say to those people, well, our models, our advice, our systems aren't built for that. Um, you need to uh, go and get a life coach or a business entrepreneur coach or whatever you're trying to do uh, because we play in the real world, we play in the truth environment and we basically show you what these models will basically say as potential uh, ability to happen. Yes, we still use wealth speed and we still use a wealth clock tool as a gauge inside more because 
we want to basically sort of showcase to people the efforts and rewards and returns you get from that. But ultimately, and we're using that as a motivator, whether that kickstarts you into action or also as a means by which it shows you the progress that you're making because that progress builds momentum, which builds habits and repeated habits will ultimately deliver you the outcome that you're looking for. Well said, mate. The reality check that the team gives is is kind of a duty of care. It's a, it's a, it's an it's really an act of love. It's actually saying, hey, listen, based on your circumstances, this is the reality, right? So there's a couple of things that you can focus on. You can actually you can actually reset where you're at based on your reality, or having an understanding that the greatest tool that you can have is your ability to earn the income and and invest as much as you possibly can on making sure that your income increases at a rate that you're in control of because you've got a new set of skills. You offer opportunity to add value to the company or add value to the marketplace so that you can increase your income. Without, without knowing that your trajectory is not able to do that, you can live in a fantasized talent, a, a, uh, a non-reality, which can be very, very crushing for you once you realize it. So the team take it very um, carefully as that duty of care, that act of love to say, this is what it looks like. This is what looking over the cliff looks like. So if, you, if you're not the person that can actually um, improve your income to a material level, this is what we need to be focusing on. So I think the, um, the fact that things will just happen, um, sometimes it's a coping strategy um, because I actually want that. I don't want to acknowledge that I can't get that, so I'll just defer it. To, that's something that I'll do in the future, right? And that's okay. Um, but you know, to, to the earlier point you made, Ben, you've done hundreds of these. Our teams have done thousands of these. These are their top five mm-hmm. that they fed back to us, right, um, to say this is what we're seeing the most um, when we're dealing with the plan. So hopefully that's helpful, folks. Uh, myth number five, the expectation that things will just happen. If there's no material change in your income, that is a myth. Um, that is something that we need to be able to be very, very clear on. So... There we go, Ben. Five really good myths there. The first one was equity equals borrowing capacity. That myth was busted. Uh, the second one was you need five plus properties to live your lifestyle by design. We've busted that myth as well. Third one, rent vesting is a magic wand. No, it's not, folks. Uh, we busted that one. Fourth one, higher income equals good management. No, it doesn't, folks. It can, but it doesn't automatically mean it is. And then the final one, that great expectations that things will just happen. Folks, um, please be very, very clear that things won't just happen unless something changes. So I just want to shout out to Joel, Amanda, Stu, and Brendan to say thanks very much for helping bring those ones um, uh, to us today that we could chat about. Um, Very much appreciated. So good ones there, Ben. Life hack today is I'm circling back around to uh, um, Brendan. Um, from our mindset minute, right? So how do we counter the Diderot effect? And so I've thought about this and I actually, um, I went deep on this and I went and um, uh, researched a whole bunch of things that you could do around the Diderot effect. But I kind of tried to think, and there's, I haven't gone an exhaustive list here, but in terms of uh, takeaways for Brendan and takeaways for someone else who might find themselves in this situation, um, a few of the answers were a bit Dorothy Dixie, right? make sure you set a budget, and if it doesn't, it, it sit you. And I thought, yeah, sure, that's cool, but wh- how does it actually um, impact the fact that I've got this new gown and I want to bring things around it? And I had this overwhelming uh, response to the first thing that Brendan could do, and he's done it, and hopefully he's helped thousands of people in our community, is awareness, just awareness. If you're aware of it, then you've got a better chance because it's not until you look back in the rear vision mirror. It doesn't have to be a renovation. Someone who moves house, they might be renting right now, Ben, and then they find a new place and they've got new energy around it and they just want to um, fall for the Diderot effect. It doesn't, doesn't have to be a renovation. So awareness in general is um, my number one life hack for the Diderot effect. The second one is buy items that fit your current system. Now, Again, I don't want to be too sort of suck eggy here, Ben, because I'm sure Brendan uh, wanted to do that. Um, he wanted to find items that fit in the current system, but caught up in um, in 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 it all. But if you can have, first of all, you have the awareness, and then secondly, you think, okay, what what do I currently have 
that'll actually allow me to be okay with what I've got. Um, another one I found was create a one in one out rule. So for every new item you bring into your life, get rid of another one. So it'll ha- help maintain possessions at a manageable level. But I'm not sure that's going to help in the moment when Brendan was facing these challenges where you know you only renovate once. Um, and then the final one is invest in experiences instead of things. All right. So you will get ex- the Diderot effect will make you temporarily excited, um, but chances are uh, over the journey those things aren't going to be as important as the experiences. So. Um, and I know you want to jump in there, Ben, so I'm just going to round it out by saying in Diderot's words, um, this is this is what he said in that essay, and it was while it was regrets of my old gown, said, let my example teach you a lesson. Poverty has its freedoms. Opulence has its obstacles. <laughs> well, I just <laughs> wanted to build on your awareness point, Bryce. Sometimes it's really hard Um, We as humans, we have our own perceptions of ourselves and how we operate. But there's been plenty of times where, you know, by way of example, you have highlighted to me something that I may not have been aware of that I do or that I and and that has been a great improvement in terms of how I conduct myself and how I then change that type of story. So sometimes if you don't have that self-awareness and you're looking to to make these changes Um, then you might need to get some professional help around that. So the tip that I want to add to your life hack here is whenever you are talking to a professional advisor, you want them to high five you on the things you're doing really well, but you also need to be eyeballed on the things that you can improve on. If you go to an advisor or a friend or a colleague or someone and they're just reinforcing your biases or or your, you know, your own awarenesses because they want to be kind, that may actually not necessarily be the best thing for you. So it really is important that if you're getting a professional opinion, that, that it's a paid professional opinion, um, then they need to be having honest conversations with you. So I just thought I'd add that in as part of the, your, uh, your life hack. There you go. Brendan, thank you again for being very brave. I reckon that'll help a lot of people, your story. Um, and which is why I wanted to double down on it today. So there you go, folks. A couple of things for, well, first of all, for you to Brendan to think about when face that in the future, but for all of us, because let's be honest, we've all suffered from the Diderot effect um, at some form in the, in the past. I'm sure everyone could put their hand up and say, yep, that was me. Hey, Ben, what's making property news? Well, mate, I thought I'd do a couple of uh, interesting stories that came to light in the last week. The first one is from a terrific source. And if you're not using this source as part of potentially your knowledge building around um, properties, society, information, uh, and data attached to those societies, can I make a recommendation that .id um, is a terrific site? So you'll see that um, .id or id.com.au. Um, we'll put that in the show descriptions. But I, I caught an interesting um, blog from Glenn, who's their census expert in there. Has Melbourne overtaken Sydney to become Australia's largest city? Well, that depends in terms of the assessment that you make. Um, we, we often refer to as significant urban areas, SUAs, but there is also another one which is called a GCCSA, which is basically the greater uh, capital city uh, statistical area. And so depending on what you look at. So I'm just going to quickly read through, Bryce, um, the latest summary, because if you do take one, Melbourne has now surpassed Sydney as the biggest metropolis in Australia. <laughs> but if you read the other one, uh, Sydney still has uh, Melbourne's uh, basis covered. So in terms of Sydney, just to give you some idea, five point, almost 5.3 million on the, cap, uh, the greater capital city. The significant urban area, they've got 4.8 um, in terms of Melbourne, uh, greater capital city, 5 million. Um, in terms of significant urban area, 4.9. So this is that's where we get them. Um, Brisbane, uh, just out of curiosity, we'll round out the rest of the capital cities. Brisbane, 2.6 million. Um, Adelaide, 1.4 million. Perth, 2.2 million. Hobart, 250,000. Just highlights the size of that city. Gets even Darwin, 149,000. And then our nation's capital, Canberra, sitting at sort of uh, 460 odd thousand people in those population centres as at the sort of June uh, 2022 census data information. So that was one story. The other interesting story, Bryce, came out of the AFR um, from the journalist Michael Reed. 
um, who talked about most inner city Melbourne and Sydney rental properties are still cheap. What? That's not what we're hearing. There's no way known. Anyway, he was referring to a ABS uh, analysis that was done on 600,000 households that were 12.5 kilometres to the CBDs of those two centres. And what was interesting about that is that uh, about 49% of rental stock in parts of Sydney within 12.5 kilometres of the CBD costs less now than in March 2020, pre-COVID, according to mm. the, that survey. And in Melbourne, it was 62%. And that's because when COVID hit, rents dropped by around 25 to 30%. So we just haven't caught up. But I think uh, it's very clear what we've been talking about. Um, it is definitely going to catch up and, and certainly surpass over the next couple of years because rental supply is just so short around the country. But I thought those two stories were interesting um, to, uh, to take a look at. So, we'll, again, we'll have the links in the show notes to those two particular stories. Ah, very good, Ben. Thank you for that uh, big show. Obviously, we covered a fair bit today. Hopefully, that's helped you folks and hopefully that's helped you get a bit of a sense of what you need to be thinking about as you're planning to become what you plan to become as you create lifestyle by design. What are some of the things that you need to be thinking about? What are some of the questions that are rattling around in the head? And these are the top five myths that we received as a team who are seeing scores and scores and scores of people's balance sheets and the conversations that they're having around what sort of lifestyle they want to achieve. So folks, uh, sincerely hope um, that that has landed for you. Hopefully you may be able to relate to one or two of those or three or maybe five. Um, but the idea is to hopefully help you get to the end goal, which is the mission of this podcast is that you create some form of meaningful lifestyle by design for you um, that has been planned for that you've methodically gone through and that you've actually trapped as much uh, surplus as you possibly can so that you can enjoy your life now, but also make sure that you don't go off that cliff at the end having run out of money. So a big, big show, Ben. I'm enjoying this um, Mythbusters. We've got one more to cover in a couple of weeks' time. Uh, we've got a very special guest next week, which I'm super excited about having uh, on the couch, the three of us chatting in studio, on the couch, um, so stick around for that next week, folks. But uh, until then, Ben. Well, Bryce, before I say my famous, famous line, I'm going to also remind people the masterclass. Bryce mentioned it earlier. If you want to build on, you know, obviously they're the myths and the mistakes that people make, but you actually want to get it right, check out our masterclass. It'll take you on a deep dive into some of the right pathways and the some of that potential and opportunity that we also talk about. So check that out in the show description. Thank you for that. And always remember, knowledge is empowering, but only if you act on it. Well said. See you next week, folks.